Neil Young, like Ian and Sylvia, is Canadian. But also Neil Young covered For Strong Winds as one of the more popular songs, actually, that he did in the 1970s. For Strong Winds is an um, Ian Tyson original. We call go out to Alberta. Weather's good there in the fall. I got some friends that I could go to work in for. Still I wish you. But also I think Ian and Sylvia were a model that they were Canadian. In those days, I mean, you don't think of it now, Canada is not remote from a media center. Toronto and Montreal, even Vancouver, they're major cities. They have recording facilities on par with anything. But back then, if you were from Canada and you were trying to make not just a Canadian impact, but an international impact, it wasn't so easy. And Ian and Sylvia were a model for Neil Young, but also people like Joni Mitchell and Leonard Cohen and the band, in that they are from Canada. But in the early 60s, they very quickly also became popular in the United States. They based themselves in New York for quite a bit of that time and recorded in New York, but they were an example. We're from Canada, maybe on the global scale of things, people think of us as remote, but we can make an impact, and not just as performers, but as songwriters. Ian and Sylvia's success outside of their native Canada presented Young with the confidence to feel that he could do likewise. Another artist Neil would encounter also demonstrated that international success on the folk scene worked both ways. While you had the American folk revival led by Dylan preeminently, but that whole Greenwich Village scene of, of, of singer-songwriters, um, something similar but different is, is happening in, in the, the UK. Um, Yes, there are singer-songwriters um, influenced by, by Dylan, but there is also this breed of um, virtuoso acoustic guitarists coming up, people like Davy Graham, and the one that Neil Young latched onto, Bert Jansch. Bert Jansch was, I think, one of the most, and possibly the most important guitarist of the British 60s folk movement certainly most impressive as a guitarist, but a decent singer and songwriter when it came time to do that. And also, like Neil Young, he could both function as a solo artist and also play within a band, which Bert Jansch did with Pentangle. The story is that um, he, he, he was staying with a friend uh, who, who had the first Bert Jansch LP on, on Transatlantic, which was the leading English folk music label of, of the 60s and uh, he played it uh, endlessly while he was staying in this apartment and loved that English finger-picking style. One morning fair I took the air down I do think that Bert Jansch, like say Ian and Sylvia, has a more sober, somber feel than Neil Young himself. I think that Neil Young certainly was more adept at injecting more humor and liveliness in general, and certainly better at full-out rock and roll than Bert Jansch and Ian and Sylvia were, or Phil Oaks. But they were all a big part of the folk side of his persona which is a very important part of his music. It would be an understatement to say that uh, it had an influence on Young, and in fact, on what is arguably considered the greatest song Neil Young ever wrote, which is Ambulance Blues, the final epic track on, on the beach. The melody is borrowed almost wholesale from Burt's Needle of Death, which is something of a signature song for him. And I think that's a great tribute that New York's greatest song should be borrowed from him in a sense. Back in the old folky days, the air was magic when we played. The river boat was rocking in. You know, if you're thinking about Neil Young and you had to say one influence, you'd have to say Bob Dylan. I mean, Dylan, you know, just as um, 
as a writer, as, as a songwriter, as a, a folk artist, as a rock and roll artist, and as a kind of artist defining his own path. I mean, I think Neil Young owes Bob Dylan a tremendous debt. I mean, they've kind of become peers over the decades, but what Dylan represented was so enormous, and every lesson that Dylan taught, Neil Young learned, you know, as far as what you can do as an artist, the kinds of expressions that you can make, the way that you can change, the way that you don't have to explain yourself to people. You know, Neil Young got every jot of that. It's interesting that in 65, he produced a series of demos for Elektra Records, and that was the peak of his Bob Dylan phase. I mean, he was actually being a protest singer. He was singing songs like The Rent Is Always Due, and, um, you know, they protesting about nothing in particular, but in a very Dylan-esque form. The demos got rejected. They were almost too, too imitative of that whole approach without being particularly original. But they're a good indicator of the way Young was thinking in terms of he wanted to be a Dylan, but he also wanted to be a rock and roller on the other side as well. You get to something like Last Trip to Tulsa on the first solo album, and it's almost sort of Neil's version of Desolation Row, and probably one of his least successful songs in my book because it's too under the, the, the influence of, of, of the great man. Um, and he's, he's very seldom returned to that song, and so I suspect he, he feels the same. Well, I used to drive a cab, you know I heard a siren scream to the corner and I fell into a dream and it was at this point that he met Stephen Stills who was in a, a group called The Company and they came over to play in Canada and they became great friends um, just from hanging out together and drinking but Stills had a similar vision I mean he was a folky coming into electric Young was an electric guy going into folk and although you know that they were mirroring each other in that sense too the meeting of Neil Young and Stephen Stills is one of those sort of great moments in, 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 in pop history. And they clearly both had an enormous amount in common, but they were coming at it from, if not opposite directions, certainly different directions. Because Stills at this time is with, with the Ogogo singers, uh, who are a kind of folkish, new Christy minstrels type outfit, uh, fairly, fairly safe. Um, but he also can hear something else in Stephen Stills, and um, I think he once said that Stephen Stills was the first white man he ever heard who sounded like a black man. They both, by this stage, they both got this huge hinterland of musical interests, rock and roll, blues, folk, country, and neither of them, I think, understand the notion that acoustic music and electric music are two separate things and ne'er the twain shall meet. So whether it's folk rock or rock folk, uh, they both meet very conveniently somewhere in the middle of this. Most of us came out of folk music, the folk rock evolution or revolution or how it started and basically the birds were the forerunners in that they weren't necessarily the only guys doing it but because of the nature of how they were assembled and terry melcher and columbia records and it was a big deal and it was a bob dylan song that they did it wasn't a song that was an uh a song that was that was written a hundred years ago by somebody in the in the appalachians made it current made it something that was going to probably make a difference as it turned out it did i mean essentially bob dylan invented folk rock you know the birds really popularized folk rock i mean there was a sense in which you know suddenly these bob dylan songs were beautiful in a conventional way. And I, I don't mean that to diminish the songs at all, but in the way that, that pop music can be beautiful, you know, those ringing guitars and, you know, all of the kind of evocative qualities that the birds got in their music, you know, that just took Dylan's songs to another level. And 
you know, introduced it to a much wider audience. The birds had a massive impact, and they also, I mean, for artists who had come out of folk music to a degree, as Neil Young did, the birds also kind of created a sense of possibility. Like, you know, we can keep everything that we got out of folk, and then play around with this other rock and roll stuff that we also love, you know, from the Beatles and, and all that came before. You know, that somehow that combination made perfect sense. And suddenly folk rock was everywhere. I mean, there's a folk rock explosion in, in late 65. Um, and this is not long after, or around the same time that Neil Young was presenting those demos to Electric. It was the obvious thing to do. Because, you, you know, you had everybody from Sonny and Cher to the grassroots to Barry Maguire, all producing songs Johnny Cash did It Ain't Me Babe, everybody was doing Dylan songs, everybody wanted to get on the folk rock bandwagon for about six months, you know, that was the, the, the buzzword and um, countless hits came through it. Is my world not falling down? I'm in pieces on the ground and my eyes aren't open and I'm standing on the door that had been opened by the Birds and Bob Dylan presented opportunities for many to follow in their footsteps. By 1966, Neil Young had moved to California and found that the way was paved to create a band with fellow collaborator Stephen Stills in Buffalo Springfield that would placate their creative need for both rock and folk forms. They're an extension of what Neil Young had experienced having been through the whole Bob Dylan thing. And so he was songwriting, and his songwriting had changed um, in the sense that there were a myriad of influences there. There was the Stone influence with Mr. Soul, which was Satisfaction Revisited. Later down the line, he got involved with Jack Nietzsche, who'd worked with the Rolling Stones, and of course Phil Spector. So you had those wonderful or orchestral experiments, like expecting to fly. At the same time, there was a, you know, from both Stills and Young, there was a strong Birds influence, and basically, you know, the, the, the genesis, I suppose, of the whole singer-songwriter movement, just in the fact of, of, of those guys. And some country stuff from Richie Furet as well. So, I mean, you had a, a, a myriad of different styles. In fact, you know, st still has brought Latin American music into the mix as well. I mean, the Buffalo Springfield were a, were a potpourri of different styles, and in some ways perfectly suited to Neil Young, because Neil Young was, was the great eclectic, eclecticist in terms of um, you know, his, his musical palette went in all different directions thereafter. And, uh, and it was, you know, crystallised in those couple of years with the Springfield, where they seemed to quite capable of conquering any musical field they, they chose to do. Well, I dreamed I saw the nights in armor saying something... Neil's use of folk and folk rock sounds would see him garner success and reverence from his early solo works on albums such as his self-titled debut, And Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere as well as providing a constant flavour throughout his subsequent back catalogue. As the 1960s drew to a close, the wind of change continued to blow, bringing about another twist in contemporary music, with a shift from folk sounds to country, which opened more channels of influence for Neil Young. The rock world at the end of the 60s was very much moving away from psychedelia. Some of the leading players, the band, the birds, obviously, more especially Bob Dylan, were going back to simpler forms of country music. It was the idea of wisdom and simplicity. The band to, you know, look very 19th century, almost frontier-like, and, and the birds when they recorded Sweetheart, the rodeo, you know, were going back to music from an earlier age, the age of Woody Guthrie as well. And Dylan with John Wesley Harding was, you know, as far as away as could be imagined from, from the world of Blonde on Blonde. <laughs> 